Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. It's April 13th, and I'm making this video blog today in order to talk about this weekend's upcoming astrology. I'm also giving this video blog because I want to talk about a, uh, a special challenge that I've taken up personally as Mercury is turning direct and one that you might want to participate with as well. So um, <clears throat> there's uh, a lot happening over the weekend. It's a big weekend astrologically, so I thought I'd make a video blog to sort of address everything that's going on at once. So let's talk about the different transits that are happening, give you a broad overview, and then go through them one by one. And then we're going to talk, after I go through all of that, we'll talk a little bit about this uh, special challenge that I've taken up, kind of a personal, part of my own personal spiritual practice. Um, and you, and I'm inviting all of my readers and friends to join me with it if you'd like. I think it's a really cool challenge, and it's really a good time for this particular challenge I'm going to tell you about as Mercury is turning direct and is going to be in a month, basically the whole rest of April will be in a square with Saturn. So that's where we're headed. All right. Um, so we have, first of all, um, as the weekend is rolling along, there are two major things that are happening. The first one is that um, on uh, Sunday, just get the exact hours correct here, on Sunday uh, around... <clears throat> Around uh, between like 9 and 10 o'clock Eastern time on Sunday evening, there will be a new moon in Aries. And this new moon is happening in those late anoretic degrees, those hot spot degrees at the, that come at the end of every sign. And um, this new moon is going to be within just about a little less than three degrees from a conjunction with the planet Uranus. So it's a big deal. It's a powerful new moon conjoining an outer planet. Not only that, but um, this transit is also in very, this new moon is also in a very close square with uh, Pluto and Capricorn. So you've got Pluto and Capricorn hovering around 21 degrees Capricorn right now. And then you have um, the new moon at about 26 Aries and uh, Uranus at like 28 Aries. So uh, you're, you're, <laughs> You're running into a new moon this weekend that is very dynamic. It's really activating the Pluto-Uranus uh, square. One thing that people don't say a lot about is the fact that um, uh, this Pluto-Uranus square is about to end. Um, we have, we'll have a little reprise of it, but um, for the most part, when planets are no longer in signs that complete the square to one another, they start taking on a different relationship. So Uranus moving into Taurus next month is going to signify that Uranus is starting to move into a trine with Pluto. So the energy starts changing. The way that the planets are relating starts changing from the more conflicted Mars-like nature of the square into something a little bit more Jupiterian and harmonious, which is nice. We've had a long season of uh, Jupiter, or excuse me, of Uranus and Pluto since like 2010-ish. 11, um, we've had these two planets squaring off and it's been very palpable. It's the planet of uh, Pluto with depth, death, catharsis, transformation, purgation, purification, the underworld, the unseen forces erupting, along with the planet of revolution, rebellion in the, you know, in the sign of Aries, God of war with Mars. So it's been, there's been, it's been a dynamic, you know, starting, if you go back to when it started, it was Occupy Wall Street. Think of all that's happened since Occupy Wall Street, right? The Arab Spring and then Occupy Wall Street and then all the way through this current moment. So uh, it should be an interesting culminating period for Uranus over the next month. But the reason that I'm mentioning all of this is because you're looking at a new moon that is highlighting one of the grand finales of the Pluto-Uranus square. So that means in the collective, we may see some um, uh, flourishing, some some feeling like a, a, an era is coming to an end, or there's a, a transition that's happening somehow in the collective. And so that kind of a new moon is going to be really palpable personally as well. You're going to feel that new moon really personally in your chart. Look at, uh, in your if you, if you know your birth chart, look at the late degrees of the cardinal signs. Any planets that you have from like 25 to 30 of uh, Libra, Capricorn, Aries, or Cancer should be quite, um, they'll, be, they'll be quite stimulated and active right now. And look at the houses that they rule, the houses that they're in, and stuff like that. So um, 
Oh, good morning, everyone. Nice to see so many people here. I see some people saying hello. So uh, what does the new moon with Uranus mean, though? It means uh, breaking the mold. It, it, it's defiant. It's rebellious. And it says, let's do something new. It's awakening. It's disruptive. It's shocking. So those are the kinds of things that a new moon with Uranus generally produces. It produces shock. It produces newness. It produces awakening. Now, ideally, uh, if we're if we're walking a, a, on a spiritual path and we're placing our relationship with the divine as the number one most important thing in our life for the sake of our spiritual health, um, then this is a transit that has the potential to awaken and stimulate development, growth, and evolution in our spiritual life, right? Not all of us place that as a priority. Even those of us who have it as a priority, it gets put on the back burner our spiritual life for so many different reasons, so many different duties and dharmas that we have in the world that we have to take care of that can distract us from our spiritual commitments, our spiritual uh, life. However, there comes a time when in all of our lives when we say enough is enough, I'm, I'm tired of not prioritizing my spiritual health. I'm tired, and we, so we need to break free. We need to be sort of liberated. Um, so that can come, that, that can be a little bit of a messy process, right? Sometimes, you know, we say enough is enough, and we seek to blame other people, other things in the world for uh, our having been cut off from our spiritual life or our, uh, our, our spiritual sense of um, uh, dignity. And... Um, in, rather than examining some of the ways in which we've put ourselves in that kind of position, we blame, well, it's my boss, it's the job, it's my wife, it's my husband, it's my kids, it's my, it's my parents, it's my in-laws. You know what I mean? We say we, put, we place the blame around us when we get away from ourselves. And then when Uranus comes in, suddenly, defiantly, especially in Aries, we want to kick the door open and say, no, it's mine. I'm, I need to get back to myself. I need to, it's time to reprioritize myself, etc." And then we end up burning bridges, hurting people. And that doesn't, that's not a, a kind of karmically clean way of getting back to ourselves. So we have to be really careful because we can actually complicate our lives further by making childish demands and sort of trying to kick the door open on our way back to ourselves, which is what the new moon in Aries might really demand of us is that we get back to ourselves. So how can we get back to ourselves in a way that is not destructive, that's not selfish, that's not damaging? There might need to be some level of confrontation. That's okay. There might need to be a new path that's taken, a bold new choice that's made. There might, you know, so that's possible, but we always have to ask ourselves, remember, whenever you've you got something so strong in a Mars-like sign, remember it tends to happen in the shadow of its opposite, which is Venus, harmony, care, concern for our friends, um, making sure that our actions are thoughtful and mindful of other forces that need to, uh, that we are dependent upon or that are dependent upon us. I was watching someone the other day, um, this was a uh, uh, sort of a, um, a, a Swami. And the Swami was, uh, uh, there was a, a story about the Swami. He's the fa famous guru from India. And there's a story about how his, you know, his uh, disciples were watching him and a, and a couple of uh, cats, dirty <laughs> like street cats, like um, kittens actually, were fighting with one another for play and rolled onto his lap. And the disciples were like, oh my gosh, these dirty cats, you know, and they went to go get the cats off from the guru. Like they didn't want to offend their guru or whatever. And their guru started petting the cats, like no big deal, like just playing with the cats. And he looked at his disciples and he said, um, if something comes into your care, if something naturally in the flow of life comes into your care, you never betray it. You never harm it. You never, you never swat it away um, because you will have you will have told it inherently that the universe is not trustworthy, that, you know, that, that God, where God sends us, where God places us is not trustworthy. So it's very, it's very, very important that if something comes into your care, that you, that you, that you take, that you take good care of it, that you not hurt it, harm it, scare it, etc. 
And it was such a lesson. This was a, just one of the disciples reflecting and saying it was such a lesson for us because here we were so worried about the, you know, the cleanliness. And rather we had to be, you know, we got this really good lesson about remembering that um, it, what trumps cleanliness all the time or the, the rightness of the, the sort of letter of the law, rightness of the situation, not letting a, a guru be uh, uh, stained, is clothing stained or, you know, whatever they had in their head as the right thing was trumped by this um, higher law. And sometimes that's what Uranus and Aries is about too. Something that we, uh, something that will come into our lives and it may there it may present us with sort of two options the right thing to do the, the the letter of the law and then the sensible thing to do the thing that might defy the rule a little bit um like i think in their tradition it was sort of like for the sake of cleanliness in the ashram it wasn't encouraged to be like touching and playing with like diseased street dogs in india right or diseased potentially diseased if you've ever been to india the cats and dogs there don't look <laughs> they look pretty shabby so at any rate but there may be um a moment where with uranus new moon you're also challenged between the the sort of letter of the law and the spirit of the law what's the right thing to do in heart and also remembering that we are as as as, as mars like as this transit is as go and do it and and initiate something new there's also a strong venetian presence there are other people in life who depend on us there are other, there are forces around us that rely on us and we rely on them and we're an, we're an interconnected web. And so um, the th there are things in our care. And so whatever bold moves we want to make, um, we have to remember that we can't, the things that are in our care, we can't just abandon or desert instantly just because we feel that we've neglected our spiritual life or we've neglected ourselves or there's something really inspiring that we want to do. Um, no matter how strongly we want to do something, if we harm, damage, betray, scare other people who are dependent upon us or in relationship with us, um, sometimes that's what ends up happening rather than the bold new thing we want to do. So we have to be very careful of that with this new moon. At any rate, okay, so that's some stuff about, and then you add Pluto into the mix, right? And then this is not just your average, this is also, uh, it's not just your average new moon. Uranus is very powerful in terms of wanting to individuate, do your own thing. But then Pluto is also about digging things up, bringing things up to the surface. And um, so this is also, there's a feeling like it's something has been a long time coming because we're reaching the end, the culmination of Uranus and Aries. This is the last new moon you'll have with Uranus and Aries for a while, right? Um, so you, you're you're looking at the and the Pluto Uranus square is also culminating. So you're looking at events that are coming that are about ready to again have a, have a grand finale effect. The feeling of an era of life or the the end of a karmic cycle or something like that. So don't be surprised if this new beginning is also signaling something er erupting um, from a deep place. It's sort of like its time is up. It's 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 time already for something to move or something to happen. So, uh, so look for that kind of quality as well. Now, the other thing that's happening that's important to note is that between now and um, Tuesday, I believe, let me just double check my, yeah, so between now and late Monday night, early Monday, Tuesday morning, Venus is also applying to an opposition with Jupiter. Okay, so what's that one about? Well, Venus applying to a um, an opposition of Jupiter. Uh, by the way, I want to I want to promote my friend's book. This book, The Archetypal Universe by Ren Butler. If you're trying to learn astrology and trying to learn about how these um, archetypes combine, I combine them every day in my posts. So that's a good way to learn them. You can always read the way that I'm combining them and sort of study them and be like, oh, I see how he's combining this planet and that planet. But um, Ren actually wrote this book that is a kind of a cookbook, um, but it's not like any cookbook that you've ever read before. It has a ton of different planetary combinations and just the language and the writing is really um, diverse and smart. So if you want a good cookbook to reference, um, check it out. I've been looking at it here and there and it's added some really cool things. Anyway, one of the things that he added, he put into his book about Jupiter and Venus, I was looking at it this morning, was um, that it has to, uh, it potentially has a lot to do with extravagance indulgence, overdoing things, spending too much, thinking you need more than you do, uh, 
high culture and snobbery, etc. Because you have the oppositional force at work, and oppositions are of the nature of Saturn. So what does Saturn do? Saturn, by its nature, has to do with loss, abandonment, cutting things apart, separating things apart from one another. Saturn was traditionally the ruler of sects, like sectarian groups that didn't like one another. Saturn is also a planet that has to do with death and mortality and old age. It's also maturity and seriousness and, and stuff like that. So when you combine that kind of hard Saturnine uh, quality within the opposition of the two benefics that represent like expansion, growth, wealth, beauty, joy, happiness, pleasure, luxury, the five the material enjoyment of the senses, you know, all this like good glowing stuff. But then you put them in this kind of Saturnine opposition, they can get snobby really quickly. And they can also, so they can be, it can be a lot about pretension. And there can also be a, um, it can also be another, um, a quality of overdoing something. So, okay, let's say you're having some people over for dinner and you really want to impress everybody, right? So you spend way, you, you buy all new China or something, you buy silver, I don't know, you go completely bonkers, right? And um, nobody notices, right? <laughs> or it, it lasts five hours and people are impressed, but then guess what? Ev now everybody wants to say, we should regularly hold our monthly meetings at your house. It's so nice. Okay, great. Now I've just set myself up to be something that I'm not, that I now have to try to keep up with constantly. But this is the kind of stuff that we do with ourselves on a small scale all the time. We're constantly trying to do things to impress people, to go above and beyond our means. And then if it's received, then we have to continue stretching ourselves beyond our means in order to keep up the illusion. So ironically, there's so much more freedom, wealth, luxury, and pleasure found in staying within your means. So this is a really good lesson for this transit, stay within your means between now and say the middle of next week. The other thing that you can look at is the joy, pleasure uh, of, of friendship, sexuality, romance, that there's a, a, a kind of romantic mood in the air right now. But you also have to be careful, again, of getting swept up. Sometimes we find something really romantic and we say, well, this is going to last forever, so, you know, we'll go for it. And then 20 years later, when it's, you know, it's not what you thought it was, then you're seeing, you know, some new age therapist who's saying, well, it's because you didn't love yourself enough. You know, and then you're like, ah, yes, if only I had loved myself enough, then I would have the perfect person and the romance that had started would never have ended, right? But all of this is, none of this is really the, the solution, right? Because it turns out that whether you love yourself or not, loving somebody else is a different story. Loving, loving somebody else and somebody else loving you and having that work out for a really long time is difficult regardless of how much you love yourself or not, right? Relationships on, on some level, even though it's important to love yourself, relationships are just difficult. So be careful that you remember as you're entertaining whatever kind of, you know, uh, over the top big feelings of love and, and sort of romantic splendor, um, remember that what goes up must come down. And it does so repeatedly and in cycles. So uh, it's, it, it, it's don't put all of your money on one horse right now. Be very careful of that. Um, also, don't, if something doesn't work out, there's also a divine discontent in Venus and Jupiter's opposition. Oh, well, something doesn't quite work out the way you wanted it to. You're a little bit misunderstood. You made a nice attempt. So something wasn't, it didn't come off as big or as grand or as whatever wasn't received in the way that you wanted it to be. Then, um, re you know, remember that um, there's, there's also a huge victory in finding and accepting exactly what something is right? It, it's not so, one of the deepest joys in life actually comes when we appropriately understand something's time, place, relevance, circumstance. We, we say, oh, that's what it is. And it's okay if it's just that. F finding love and acceptance in the heart for the way that things are in their appropriate size and portion helps us locate ourselves in time and space. And it turns out that locating ourselves and actually being real about where we are is one of the richest places to be in the whole universe. So it's it's very important that we don't get out of proportion, that we don't blow things out of proportion this 
next four or five days as well. Okay, so those are just some things to um, to think about as these two transits come through. Now, last but not least, I uh, promised you all that I would tell you about a challenge that I've taken up. We had a Swami in the Bhakti tradition come and visit our studio recently, our yoga studio. And he gave a challenge that I have taken very seriously. It really moved my heart. Um, I have a uh, uh, Mars, in modern astrology, you call it a Mars um, Mercury conjunction. In ancient astrology, they're out of sign, so it's called, actually, it's called an Antitia. But um, either way, uh, I had Saturn go in opposition to my natal Mars last year. And then in, it's been in opposition to my natal Mercury. And uh, one of the things that I've been working on personally over the past year has been a um, daily meditation challenge to try and work with the busyness of my mind. And I've been meditating and in spiritual practice for a long time, but like probably many of you, intermittently, I start, I stop, I start, I stop. So I had started... Uh, training and studying with the teacher and getting really immersed into bhakti yoga about a little over a year ago as this as this transit from mars to mercury and mars to or uh, saturn to mars and mercury was happening and as i studied bhakti more and more i realized that i needed to get steady in my practice so i started meditating every day and getting up before sunrise to meditate every day and as we approach the summer solstice um knock on i mean if i make it i'll have meditated before sunrise for at least 30 minutes um, every day for a year. So that's what I'm coming up, coming up on that accomplishment. And uh, it, it feels really, really good. It's been one of the best things that I've done for myself. And I would highly recommend other people taking up and trying to make a steady, committed meditation practice. Um, uh, for me, it's been chanting. I, I've chanted. Um, and I'll uh, maybe at some point later I'll do a video on chanting and, and some things that you might try yourself. But for now, what I want to tell you about is this. As this has gone on, my practice, especially after India, my practice has really increased. So I've been meditating and chanting uh, a lot more. And um, uh, as that's happened, we had this Swami visit and he had this challenge for people who, another challenge for people like myself who are trying to uh, deal with a very active mind. So, um, he handed out rubber bands. You can see the rubber band here. It's, it's got a piece of lint on it. Uh, so, um, pull this off. Okay, so um, he handed out these rubber bands, and um, he said, imagine that the patterns that you have in your mind are like um, little rubber bands. And every time that you think a critical thought of someone else and utter a critical statement to somebody else, um, basically, it's like a repetitive snap in your mind. It's a little pattern that's forming. It's snapping over and over and over again. The more it snaps and the more you tell yourself, oh, it's enjoyable to criticize people. I like doing it or it's something that I do. Then it, it repeats and it becomes more and more natural, right? This is basic stuff. He said, um, but sometimes what we need is we need a, you know, a physical way of uh, reversing the pattern. So you have to start telling yourself, oh, it actually feels good to not criticize people or to not think critically about others or about situations. So he said, try this challenge. He said, put your rubber band on your wrist. And he said, uh, you know, good habits, let's say, take about 21 days to form and last. Committed to 21 days, usually you can start or kick something. Uh, so he said, um, in this 21 days, uh, every time that you criticize somebody or gossip or say something in a mean spirit, um, take the rubber band off one hand and switch it to the other. And your goal is to keep it on one hand, meaning you don't gossip or criticize or speak in a mean spirit to somebody um, for 21 days. On you'll 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 reach it because you haven't switched the rubber band from one hand to the other. So um, right now I am uh, failing quite regularly, but improving. Um, I am at a point now where I went two days in a row without criticizing, gossiping, speaking negatively. They're still going on in my head, right? But as he said, he said, but as you think of uttering it, it's like the rubber band's pulling back and you're catching it. And you're saying, oh, nope, I'm just going to relax that and not utter that word. I'm not going to utter that critical thought. Now, this is just to clarify, we're not talking about saying things like, hmm, 
Virginia, my daughter, I don't think you should, uh, you know, I don't think you should jump off your toy chest right now <laughs> or, or like critic, you know, like, or don't touch the hot stove, you know, or, you know, what, or what have you, or you're in a position where you have to objectively report about something that's happened. That's not gossip. Or you have uh, something to say to reflect upon, but you can't. You can still say it in a constructive way, in a non-passive aggressive and constructive way, in an honest and kind way. You know, so it's not. It's not like something to be super crazy about. But I, as Mercury is going, um, as Mercury is going uh, direct and is going to be in a square to Saturn for the rest of the month. This is a really good time to commit to something like this. So I'm inviting you all to try it. In the meantime, I've ordered 500 uh, wristbands that say um, <clears throat> uh, that say uh, um, uh, kind words, clean heart, and they're in uh, blue. And I will be giving these to the Swami who visited so that he can take them to his future talks as a, just a gift to him. But I'm going to keep some so that if people who are my, my readers would like to have one, I'll, I'll mail one to you and you can play with it and, uh, and try the challenge yourself. But for now, see if you can find a rubber band. And uh, for 21 days, see if you can keep it on one hand without switching. Right now, what I'm finding the most difficulty with is that my mind naturally being so sort of incisive and intellectual with astrology assesses things very critically and i'm learning that so profoundly right now and i'm finding my way in holding the rubber band and not going into the let's criticize the situation but relaxing it i'm finding that my heart is getting involved in my head the two are coming together so if you're interested in that then i hope that you'll check it out all you need is a rubber band it's really simple okay guys that's what i have for you today um I wish you the best with it if you try it. Let's see, there's some questions. <clears throat> what time day is your UAC lunch lecture? I believe it's at whatever it's at whatever time lunch is, noon, I think, on Friday. Thank you. I hope some of you will be there. A sweetness about appropriateness, which is rich, and an alignment with available energies, an agreement with what is special moment. Yeah, the Jupiter-Venus opposition is really like fragrant and beautiful like it's a really beautiful transit so i feel like i'm i err on the side of like be careful about this be careful about that because i want people you have to be very careful with planetary transits not to get swept up in them and become the puppets of them so that's generally where i go with what i have to say about planets but um they're very beautiful energies to participate in too like venus and jupiter opposition my wife and i are going for a walk around the lake later today and um it's beautiful outside today, right? And we're going to go, I think we're going to go pick some flowers too for our altars. So at any rate, um, yeah, it's a really lovely time for uh, all all things, art, beauty, culture. You know, it's nice. Just you don't get lost in the, <laughs> the extravagance of it either. Deborah says, I do the rubber band thing too to quit doing things. Also, I'm on year three of meditating every day before sunrise and every day at sunset, 20 minutes at a time. Transcendental meditation has been a game changer. Oh, beautiful. So glad to hear that. Yeah, I, I think it's so important. I chant the Maha Mantra, which is the Hare Krishna Mantra, and uh, I chant that in the morning and later in the afternoon as well. And uh, chanting really works for me. I just, I absolutely love it. So Japa with the beads, I chant. So when you, if people want one of these free wristbands that I'm getting, uh, on one side it actually says Hare Krishna with an exclamation point, and the other side it says, uh, clean uh it says um kind words clean heart and then what i'll be doing with people is sending just a little folded thing about um how to meditate just like a little like here's some tips for different ways you can meditate and some suggestions i feel like one of the things that one of the di new bold directions that i'm heading in in my life is to try to work more intentionally and overtly to incorporate spiritual practice into astrological offerings because although i love astrology um it it tends to be such a mental and intellectual discipline and i i say this as someone who loves it so much but it tends to be so mental and so analytical and i i've seen many people in the astrological world all, in all different walks of life um really could use and take astrology so much further with um better basically spiritual and like sort of spiritual living um, uh, 
practices. So that's something that I hope to be be making a more regular and sort of overt part of my work coming forward. So little things like the rubber band to help help people. All right. <clears throat> Sign me up for a wristband. I could use that. Awesome. Yeah, you can use them for lots of things, you know, like well, I I plan on um, using, there's a few other things on my list, so. <laughs> oh, thanks, Nicole. That's really nice. I do feel relaxed and joyful today. It's beautiful out. Um, <clears throat> might be hard not to criticize 45. Yes, and so what I do is, I, for me, if I don't have something kind to say, I just don't say anything at all. Because there's, of course, there's plenty of reasons to criticize. I just leave that to the news anchors. I leave that to the politics. There's a reason that politics, the word politics, is based on the word poly, which is means polarization. I don't find, although, although I think it's important, all of the stuff that's happening is important, I find myself so spun out by it that my mind goes into an endless tunnel of, of dark negativity when I, when I go there. So I just don't, but, but I hear what you're saying, Bonnie. Anyway, um, I'm working with White Terra today. Oh, nice. Victoria Ann, could you recap briefly one more time what you did with the rubber band when you catch yourself being critical? Yeah, so if you're critical, if you say something like, um, okay, so here's an example. Um, I said, I now this one is going to seem extreme, but I was, I really like got upset with my, um, my dog Rhea stole my daughter's muffin. <laughs> my dog ate my daughter's muffin and I launched into a whole critical analysis of my dog. <laughs> it was totally like my dog got sad. So I, I switched my wrist. I switched it from one hand to the other. Okay. I critic. there was a criticism and it wasn't, I could tell not so much because it was so serious, but because of the tone and mood that I was in, it was mean. So I switched it. <clears throat> so critical being critical. It, we're, we're not talking about being careful thinker, being, a, being intelligent. We're talking about being critical, being incisive and sort of mean about the way we think about things or the way we speak. But the point that he was making was that when you, you keep it on one wrist for 21 days without criticizing and you'll have really taught your mind that it's pleasurable, it's actually desirable and, and beautiful to not criticize. So um, that's what I'm working on right now. Okay. All right, guys. You guys have a very lovely day, everybody, and a very nice weekend. Take care.